one of the most commonly asked questions that I've heard of from family members who, who have loved ones who are incarcerated. And it's a question of, does my family member or my loved one need to drop out in order to be found suitable for parole? How many have had that question asked to them or have asked themselves? Yes, it's one of those questions of, will the commissioners find my loved one suitable for parole if they choose not to go SNY, or as they call it today, non-designated program? So our next speaker is gonna share how he did not have to drop out in order to be found suitable for parole. I'd like to invite up Mr. Ron Alvarado. It's, it's, been, um, it's been a journey of self-discovery. It's been a journey of bumpy roads. But for the most part, where I'm at today, I understand today that it's, I had to go through everything that I did in order to get to where I'm at today. I want to start from the very beginning. I didn't grow up in a trap house. I didn't grow up with bad parents. I grew up with both my mother and father. I went to a, I went to a private Catholic school for eight years. And for the most part, my upbringing was, was, was pretty rough. The only thing that I remember that, that affected me in a way where I, later on in life, looking back in hindsight, was the fact that both my parents had to work. They both migrated here from Guatemala. And the thing is that in order for us to sustain a way of life that we had, it was just a studio apartment I remember at the time. They both had to work two jobs. So I was left by myself most of the time at home. And then when my sister came along, I was parentified. So I was, I was given responsibilities at a very young age. At that time, it didn't really seem like, it didn't seem like uh, anything that was out of the ordinary. But I started to realize that around the age of 10, 11, I began to rebel. I, I didn't want the responsibility anymore and I would act out on it because of it. I grew up in Santa Monica, California and I eventually started seeking out affirmation. I started seeking out negative attention, negative reinforcement from my peers around the neighborhood. And eventually I I became a gang member. I became a gang member because these guys, I felt in my heart, actually appreciated me for my bad deeds. And it was something that I was given that I felt like I lacked at home. But it was just, uh, for myself, it was something that was, that was unreal. It was something that wasn't real that I wanted, but I had it at home. I remember my, the commissioner asked me, the commissioner asked me one time, in 2010, he asked me, where do you think you went wrong? Where was that pivotal moment in your life where you feel that it had a, that it had a, a monumental type of significance where it, it, you ended up going the wrong way? And for me it was when I was 13 years old and my mom, God bless her soul, she's still here with me, she told me, that she wanted me to continue to go to, to a private school. I had other intentions, I had different motives, I had, I had a whole other plan. And I remember failing that exam on purpose so that I didn't have to go to private school because I wanted to go to public school with the rest of my life. That right there was, um, that was a bad move. It was a bad move thinking back. When I stop and I think about when I see all these gentlemen here and their stories and seeing you all here today, it brings back a flood of, 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 of unwanted emotion and feelings and thoughts. But it reminds me that that's what makes me human. It reminds me that that's the person that I was meant to be. For so many years, that's who I was. 
And today, it's not, it's not the individual that I am. I remember throughout my entire life while in prison. So just so you know, I was incarcerated at the age of 16. I, right after my 16th birthday, I caught a murder. I, I committed a murder uh, with the use of a firearm, second degree murder. And um, I was charged as an adult. I went to juvenile hall, went to YA, uh, did a, a quick stop at the county jail, and then ended up in prison at the age of 18 at Chino State Prison right after my 18th birthday. I remember how um, at that time, I, I knew what I wanted at that time. I knew that I didn't want to be weak. I knew that I wasn't going to be soft. And I knew that whatever I did, I would go 100%. And I did. I really did. Um, by the age of like 20, 21, I was, I was racking up stabbings, thinking that this is, the, this is the individual who I have to be. This is who I'm going to be. And it became, it became apparent that, that this path that I was taking, it, 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 wasn't gonna, it wasn't leading in a good direction. But at that time, I really didn't care. Why? Because I had a life sentence. I had 19 years to live. And everybody was telling me I'm not going home. But the one thing that, that I failed to realize was the fact that I still had people that loved me. My mom, my dad, my grandmother, my aunt. And after 2004, my, my aunt passed away, an aunt of mine that I was very close with. And I think that was the first hit where I, where I actually felt something. And for me, that, that feeling was, I, I hated it. I hated feeling vulnerable. I hated feeling weak. So it's, it's, it's not a surprise that I, I picked up a habit in prison. I started doing, I started doing cocaine. I started doing crystal meth. I got into heroin. And that helped me for a very long time. And I remember, it, it's, it, it's, it's funny, um, but it's interesting that, that Lou mentioned about the faces that we put on for different people. And I remember seeing my mom coming up to see me. That's my mom and my sister and my dad, they were like the only people that week in, week out, they were always there for me. However, I always took them for granted. Because I, I was shown, I would put on the mask that I needed them to see. I didn't want them to see the pain. I didn't want them to see the hopelessness, the hate, the anger that I carried with me every single day. And that and all that, all that negative energy, all that hate. I took it out on other people. I took it out on other people and I took it out on myself. And I did that for years. <coughs> As the years went by, I continued to move up in the ranks. Um, I already knew if I'm gonna spend the rest of my life in prison, I wanna live comfortable. I want the drugs, I want the money, I want the power. I want it all. So I set out on that path and in 2006, while on that path, a college program uh, came to Sentinel State Prison. This was in 2006, I want to say. And a friend of mine told me, hey, um, are you going to enroll in, in college? Right? And I was like, for what? You know, it's, like, it's not like I'm going to get out anytime soon. And he goes, well, what else do you have to do? And so I took him up on that challenge because I felt it was a challenge. I always need a challenge. And so I took that challenge and I ended up going to school and suffice to say, I ended up, I ended up getting my degree and in, in, I got my associate degree in 2009. I ended up getting that, but however, that still didn't deter the path that I was on. I continued to do drugs. I continued to be involved in criminal and gang activities because that's what fueled my motivation. It's what made me feel important. It made me feel like I mattered. So in 2010, I went to board for the very first time. And I remember the commissioner asked me, so why did you commit your crime? And I told him, well, self-defense. It was either him or me. And I remember I remember the commissioner just, just nodding like, 
how clueless, and like thinking back today, how clueless of a boy. I was in my 30s at that time, but I was really just a boy. I was a boy that had all my, all my facts wrong, my priorities, all disorganized. I was a walking distortion. I had no idea of what it was to actually really be a man. I had no idea what it was to actually be responsible or be accountable for my actions. I had no idea whatsoever. No one ever taught me that. And the thing is, that's not really true. My dad taught me that. These are things that my dad and my uncle and, and, and my family had told me when I was just a little kid. But I chose to look elsewhere for that love. That wasn't me, that was my choice. In 2000, a little, right after, right after I went to board, I remember how depressed I felt. Then I got high and I felt better. And before I knew it, I was headed off to a different, to a different prison. I was headed down to Chukawala State Prison, a level two, finally. And thinking back, at that moment in time, I'm thinking to myself, like, this is a new beginning for me. I'm going to try something new. I went to board. Hey, I got a three-year denial. Things, gotta be Things have to be better the next time around. But my actions were completely against everything that I, that I had set out to be. In order for me to get out, I needed insight. I needed to feel remorse. Right? I needed to have the willingness to change. But did I have that at the time? No. I sat there and I told the board what, they, what I thought they wanted to hear. It was all lies. I didn't feel like that. Soon after that, I ended up going to administrative segregation because I thought it was a great idea to go to a new prison, claim it as my own, run it as my own, run drugs, traffic, thinking that, okay, I can do this. But hey, I'm also going to school and I'm doing good, right? So I'm doing all right, I'm balancing it all out. Well, I got a reality check uh, in, in April of that year. I ended up going to administrative, seg uh, administrative segregation, like I said, for a race ride. And then I beat the race riot because you know what? I called out the, the, uh, the correctional officer that, 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 wrote, that wrote me up at the time. And I had him come to my hearing and I asked him what he saw me do. Because I'm so smart. I, I already know what the answer is gonna be when I ask him that. The, the officer that actually wrote me up wasn't even there so I knew that he couldn't actually say that he saw me participating in the riot. I beat that riot. However, five days before I was supposed to go back out to the main line, the gang investigators come to my door. And they tell me, uh, Mr. Alvarado, can you step out? Uh, because um, we have reason to believe that you're a gang associate. And I explained to them, like, I'm not coming out. I haven't done anything wrong. Long story short, I ended up getting validated. <clears throat> I ended up getting validated in 2010. And after that happened, when we talk about that, that endless abyss of loss of hope, that's what hit me. I had this, I had this, I had this massive sense of, of, of hopelessness. And I remember, and, 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 and it breaks my heart and I get so emotional every time because I remember seeing my mom coming to visit me behind the glass and to let her know that I, I, she was never gonna see me ever again. And I couldn't bring myself up to actually tell my mom that I would never be out, I would never get out. From, 2000 and, from 2004 to 2007, I lost my, my aunt, I lost my dad, and I lost my, and I lost my grandmother. And um, during that time, I, I still remember like, having all these feelings, this flood of emotions just coming through me. And I didn't know how to deal with it. No one's ever taught me how to deal with grief. No one ever taught me how to deal with pain. So we're turning to anger. 
because I didn't know what I didn't know I didn't know what those feelings were. And I remember because I t I couldn't take it out on anybody else, I took it out on myself. <clears throat> I remember going on a four month on a four month drug binge, heroin, crystal meth, alcohol, pills, whatever you got that's gonna get my head out of the gutter, I'm gonna take it. For four straight months, I went from 162 pounds to about 141 pounds. And I remember my mom coming up to see me and I had, I had let my hair grow out, I let my beard grow out because I was just done. I was done, I, I didn't want to continue living this life. However, part of, part, part of me just, I, I needed to sustain that, that sense of self because I didn't know who I was without being a gang member. I had no idea who I, I had no idea who Ronald Alvarado even was. None. And that's a scary feeling. And I remember while, while I was in the shoot, I'm trying to figure out how to get out. I'm tapping into resources. I'm, and, and, and I'm trying hard because at, the, at this time around, like after I went through my whole self-loathing and self-pity, my eighth grade teacher wrote me a letter. And he told me, no matter what you do, Jesus will always love you. He told me that. And I was like, where did that even come from? <laughs> How does that even happen? I just get a letter out of the blue, and, and here it comes, and I open it up, and it's just like, that's something that I needed to hear. That's something that I needed to feel. <laughs> I remember shortly after, I, I set out on a different path, a path of betterment. I was like, I'm not an idiot. I'm not stupid. I was like, if I really want to get out, there's things that I need to do in order to get it done. I've, I attained each and every goal that I set out to do when I got incarcerated. I attained every goal that I wanted. I got everything I wanted in the criminal aspect. But now I had to look for something else in a positive, progressive way. And I started, and I set out on that path. And it's funny because I, 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 I met Kathleen, I wrote her a letter. I wrote Kathleen a, a letter thinking like, all right, this program's gonna get me out. I'm gonna write her, she's gonna get me out. Because I always took shortcuts to get what I wanted. And Kathleen, I remember telling me, send me your transcripts from your last hearing. I was like, all right. I sent her, I sent her my transcripts thinking that I was gonna basically, I, I was hoping she enabled me. I was hoping she was gonna tell me like, hey, you did a great job. You know, You're like, I don't know why they didn't let you out. But I got the complete opposite. <laughs> I got the complete opposite. It was, she was like, there's no insight. There's no remorse. Like, what are the causative factors? What led you to pick up a gun and shoot someone? How do you continue to live the same way that you're continuing living? Like, how is it that you do that? What drives that? I don't understand. And I didn't understand. And I, and I, and I remember I, I kept in contact with her in different programs like prep because I had to do everything um, I had to do everything uh, by hand because it, um, I was in the shoot for six years. I went from Tehachapi to Pelican Bay. And, and my only source of, 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 of contact was that, it was just a pen and paper. And just, just hearing them talk to me and, and, and I reached out and my mom, she, would always, she was always there just always for support. My mom always telling me, like, Mijo, you're gonna get out. Like, just keep doing what you're doing. Like, my mom had no idea how to help me get out. Like, this isn't something that, as individuals, like, you guys know what to do in order to get out. I know you don't. You really don't. The thing is that it's up to us to actually, like, provide you with some tools, like, so you know how to support your loved one. Because little do you know that just by you showing up every weekend, it melted in my heart for so long, even prior, prior to, because I took everything for granted initially, but when I started to make a change, when I started seeing my mom coming up to Tehachapi every weekend, having to make, having to make appointments, having to, having to drive up all the way down to Pelican Bay just to see me for, for a couple of hours. You know, that, those are things that I had, I had to seriously seek. I had to really look deep inside like, who am I really? Because I remember looking at myself in the mirror and being like, you're not worth anything. You're nothing. And I hate you. 
Why? Because you cause me problems, the family problems, and even the people that, the, 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 of the lives that you've destroyed. This is what I would tell myself in the mirror. And how do I change that? First, I had to gain that insight. And Kathleen, you, you have no idea, but you coming into my life was such a blessing. In so many ways. Um, because you dared to, 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 to challenge me, to push me, to tell me, like, no, that's not right. Like what you think you're saying is not what people want to hear. I had to come from deep inside, and 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 and, and in that, I, I decided to just start telling my story, start being honest with myself, being honest with myself, being honest with my mother, being honest with my wife. Now, the thing is that for years, my mom never knew that I was even a gang member or that I used drugs. Not me. But I remember having that one conversation with my mother in 2013 when I was behind I was behind glass and I told my mom and my sister, I said, I have a problem. I said, I'm a drug addict. I said, aside from the criminality, having you know the criminal mindset, I'm also an addict. I'm addicted to this lifestyle. And I need to rid myself of that. So little by little, and, and when I when I when I got out of the shoe after three hunger strikes after petition after petition, I remember it was, it was in 2016 when I was released and I, and I went to Soledad State Prison. And uh, right then and there, I continued to hit the ground running. Like I had a choice. Do I continue to involve myself in gang activity or do I turn a different lead? Do I start attending programs? Do I, do I, do I try to, to make a change? And that's when it began for me. I started making a change. I went and I would go to church, but at that time I no longer felt shame because of the individual that I was starting to become. Because I started feeling that change. Everything just started to change. Looking through my transcripts, it's like, why, can't, why, why is it that I can justify killing another man or shooting at people in the streets? How is it that I can justify hurting another inmate or creating a situation where it's okay for that inmate to be harmed? or for me to harm another inmate. How did I get there? Distortions, right? Uh, belief systems that, you know, as we heard, are, are warped in, in, in a sense where we tend to create a whole different type of entity of why we become the way we become. And why is that? So that's something that I really had to dig deep down inside to figure out. And the thing is, I remember, I remember telling everybody there, like, I'm about progress. I started attending meetings from AA to CGA to NA to Gogi. I even picked up different card games where they had to do with, with, uh, with situations where I had to kind of challenge my, 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 my moral compass. Like how is it that I can, I, I can see someone else get hurt and not have any feeling about that? That had to be wrong. So I, and, and another thing that Lou, that, that Lou mentioned was about challenging every thought every belief, every idea, and that's when it started to change for me, challenging those thoughts. And I remember that when um, I reached out to, I reached out to, uh, to, to an attorney, Tracy Lum, who I had been in contact with while I, was, while I was in the shoe, I explained to her my whole situation, and she wanted to help me out, but she was like, I can't help you out if you're a gang affiliate. She's like, how am I gonna get you out if you're involved in criminal, uh, criminal activity and gangs? And I explained to her, well, I'm not really involved. I, I, I don't do anything. I just have a label. So she goes, if you can get out of the shoe and continue to live the way that you're living and not involve yourselves, and not involve yourself in any gang activity or drugs, she goes, I'll take your case. I was like, okay. Two months after I got out and I was in Soledad, I was doing what I was doing, but I didn't want to contact her just yet because I wanted to make sure that the way that I was living was the way that I was going to carry on my life. And that was something that for me, obviously the temptation of getting high and doing this and doing that, the cell phones, the temptation was, I have to admit, I don't want to sit here and lie. I did use drugs and I did use cell phones. However, 
it came a point towards the end where I decided to myself like I don't I don't want to do any more drugs. And I remember I remember finally just stopping. I stopped and I continued to go to these programs because at the end of the day, I remember this one man telling me, I won't say his name, but this one individual tells me, you can't have your you can't have uh, you can't have your feet on, on both sides of the fancy toy. He goes, either you're gonna go this way and do it this way, or you're gonna continue to be a part of what we're doing here. And I was like, I got his support. He pushed me in order to to continue to doing the right things, and without having to feel the, the shame that I'm doing something wrong. And so I did that, and I stopped using drugs. I met my wife through a cell phone there. <laughs> I met her. I met her, I met her online. <laughs> She's still here with me. You know. Um, but I, I made that commitment to change. And when I went to board, I basically told them everything. I told them, yes, I am so-and-so from so-and-so. Yes, I did this, and I did that. And at that time, when I did get caught, I was only sorry because I got caught. Did I really care at that moment in time? I didn't. However, today, the individual that I am today, as you can see, for over the years, I've, I've been trying to change, I explained to them. I no longer involve myself in, in criminal and gang activity. I'm not picking up uh, 115s for, for drugs and alcohol and or telephones or anything like that. So for me, it was, I had to change the behavior. And believe me, like, it, it, it hasn't been easy. It wasn't easy. And like I told the board, I, and, and it's funny, by the way, Tracy Lum ended up taking my case. She ended up taking my case pro bono actually um, and I, I sat there and, and I explained to I explained to uh, I explained to the commissioner I was like I'm I'm a work in progress I said because they asked me have you changed I said I'm a work in progress and uh, my attorney turns around and looks at me startled thinking like I said the wrong thing but I followed up with I followed it up with it but I will always be a work in progress whether in here out there it doesn't matter I will always be a work in progress and it's the truth, because even today, I have three years and five months out today. Um, wow. Three years and five months. Today, I'm, um, I, I, I ended up getting certified uh, as a drug and alcohol counselor. Um, that's what I've been doing uh, as far as my career path. I work at Paragon Recovery, and that, that, I have two beautiful daughters, my mom, my wife. So, my, 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 my sister, you know, she, she decided she just she didn't know, but she ended up going out to Big Bear with you know my nephews and stuff. And um, but my family is still there, and that is what is important for me today. And am I still in contact with some of my guys that are still doing their thing? Absolutely, I am. However, when they talk to me and I talk to them, it's not about hey who got stabbed, hey where's the dope at, or hey how much money are you guys making. Or where is this, where is that? It's like, hey, what are you doing to change? What are you doing to change? So many times do I hear, oh, they're not letting me out, they're not letting me out. And it's just like, it's not that they're not letting you out, it's you're impeding your own progress. You're impeding that. Because if you really want to get out, I, I understand that there's certain circumstances that will pop up and whatnot. However, if you really want to get out, then you have to put in the work. It's like we tell people in recovery. It's like, you don't get sober by not doing the work. You don't stay sober by not doing the work. It's hard and it's difficult. However, you have to have a plan. If you don't have a plan, you won't succeed. Bottom line. If you don't have a plan, you won't succeed. I just break that down like it's pretty much in a business, in a business aspect. You have, you, have to have, you have to have plans, you have to have goals, and, 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 and you have to figure out ways on how to attain that. And in order to do that, you have to put in the work and you have to be willing to feel uncomfortable. Are you gonna feel vulnerable? Absolutely. Are you gonna feel pain, sadness, depression? Absolutely, that's gonna happen. However, that's normal. We all feel that, right? We all feel sadness. It's, a, it's what makes us human. So today, I just wanna to say thank you. I wanna to say thank you for you guys coming 
coming by. It means much more than you guys could ever imagine. And I know your loved ones in there. If they, even if they are taking it for granted right now, stick with them because eventually they will, that light bulb will finally light up. Where they will take that proper step and they will take the initiative to change. Because that's what it comes down to. It's about change. And the thing is, if they really, really want it, and I know they do, it's just about just that little nudge sometimes. It's all it takes. And that's why I wanted to show up here today because I feel that all of us here and what we do is basically give a message out and hoping that it, that it, that it, that it transcends so that people can uh, receive it in a, in a way where it's positive. We've, co we've committed heinous crimes. And I know that we all live by making a living amends to them. It's what we do. It's what we, it's what we should do. And that's why I continue to live my life the way that I do. And there's, there's, there's amends that I can't make anymore, but there are amends that I continue to make, you know, in, in hopes that, I, that we can help other people in different ways, in any which way. And right now, it's, it's, it's helping them individuals kind of figure out that path on how to get that date. But more so, how to change the individual that they were brought up thinking that they were supposed to be. We're always constantly changing. And, and that's what's important here today. So in closing, I just wanted to say thank you and to the rest of the panel here. And I feel blessed today. And I'm very appreciative. Thank you.